Thank you for taking the time out of your day and potentially your lunch hour to join us for this learning session. My name is Lindsay Arndt. I'm the Executive Director Registrar at the ACCLXT. To my left, Anne Astley, CEO and Registrar of AXELPA. To my right is Leanne Laranger, Practice Advisor at Physiotherapy Alberta. And our conductor today, Teresa Bateman, who is the Director of Practice and Communication here at the CLPNA. This project was funded with help from the Alberta government in the area of OHS. So I'm sure some of you were thinking when you got the evite to join this webinar, what does a regulatory body care about this issue? Why do they have a vested interest in coworker abuse? The CLPNA has done a tremendous amount of research in the area and has a great document entitled Mental Injury in the Healthcare Workplace. One aspect they touch on in the paper is just that, why should regulatory bodies care? Well, it's simple. Our mandate is protection of the public. If you as a member are battling with psychological hazards in the workplace, it can affect your ability to do your job. If you cannot do your job, duties practice, or you are mentally injured while doing those duties, it can and will affect patient safety. When patient safety is put at risk by a regulated professional, it then becomes an issue for the regulator. The five partner colleges surveyed our members at the end of 2014. I'm sure some of you on the line can recall doing that survey. And out of that data, which Anne will elaborate on later in the session, it became very apparent that this was an issue that needed to be addressed. Over the last 18 months, we worked to create some great resources to help make people aware of what coworker abuse is and how you can deal with it. So we're going to do some polls today throughout our session. And we'll start with our first poll, which Teresa is going to bring up here for us. And do you believe coworker abuse is a significant issue in your workplace? And I think you have the option of not at all, somewhat, or very much so. So we'll give you guys a few seconds to answer the question. And then when we close the poll, we'll let you guys know uh, what the results were. A couple more seconds. Okay, we're gonna close the poll now. So, we had 50% were somewhat, 36% were very much so, and 15% were not at all. All right, so now that you guys have let us know what you believe is an issue with coworker abuse, let's do a second poll. So I'm gonna give you the option of, is eye rolling, sarcasm, and gossip considered coworker abuse? Now you need to decide if that's true or false. Again, we'll give you guys a few seconds. Okay, okay we're closing the poll. It should pop up on your screen here and let you guys know that 94% of you say true and 6% of you say false. So, the ones that say true are correct. Those workplace eye rolling, sarcasm, and gossip are considered coworker abuse. So, we I entitled the next slide. <clears throat> are you sure that is bullying? Because we need to identify what the abusive behaviors are. Because sometimes it's not always apparent. So the first identifier we have is backstabbing, and that takes in the form of spreading rumors or gossiping with the intent of hurting someone. The behavior involves complaining about someone or directly with or without directly speaking to that individual. The next uh, key identifier was broken confidence, and that happens when someone repeats information that was told to them in confidence. Failure to respect privacy. This can take in the form of spying, stalking, going through someone else's things, tampering with electronic communications such as texts and emails. Infighting. This can take in the form of bickering between individuals and as it escalates can be turned into formation of hostile rival groups. Um, our next one is intimidating behavior. You might see this when someone is impatient, yells or swears at other people, is critical all the time, hands out undeserved punishments or evaluates someone's work unfairly. Nonverbal innuendo. This form of abuse is sometimes harder to detect, but as we said, actions like raising eyebrows, rolling eyes, sarcasm are examples of nonverbal innuendo. Sabotage takes into the form of when you set someone else to look, set someone else up to look bad or to set up to fail. 
It can be things like giving someone a bad report, making excessive demands, establishing impossible deadlines, or even blocking applications for training, for leave, or a promotion. Scapegoating, <clears throat> one person gets the blame or the fault, even if it's not their issue. Threatening behavior starts to escalate into things like angry outbursts, swearing, throwing objects, or physically abusing someone with a small degree of threat or further or more intense pain. Undermining activity, this happens when people refuse to work with others, ignore requests for help, exclude people, give the silent treatment, or make comments to undermine someone else's confidence. Verbal affront. This again is a little bit hard to detect, but it's things like making snide remarks, ridiculing others, sarcasm, calling names, being condescending, or telling politically incorrect jokes. And lastly, withholding information. This can happen when someone purposely withholds important information to make someone else look bad. They could refuse to provide answers that they know or leave out important information. So I know that was a long list of behaviors, and I'm sure some of you might be surprised at some of the behaviors listed and how often you may see those behaviors at your particular work site. Do you also start to see that this can directly affect patient safety? Notwithstanding all the psychological hazards, things like withholding information, setting people up to fail, can have a direct negative impact on the patients you are caring for. But not everything is abusive behavior, and we felt it important that we highlight this to you. So with all the issues we just identified, we're going to outline some areas that are not abusive behavior. Part of an employer's role is to manage their employees. While sometimes things like constructive criticism from your supervisor, participating in performance appraisals, developing plans to improve work performance may not be pleasant, but they do not constitute abuse. So I'm going to turn the floor over to my colleague, Anne Astley from Axelpa, so she can start our next poll. Okay, now that we've had the opportunity um, to learn a little bit more about what abusive behavior is, we'd like to do a poll to determine whether our participants today have ever been exposed to co-worker abuse. So we just ask if you would take a moment to respond to the next poll, please. see that the responses are coming in quickly. We'll give it just another moment or two. Okay, I think that's uh, great. Thank you for, to those that uh, participated. Um, as you can see from the results, um, the majority of our participants today, actually 77%, say that they have experienced it directly um, with a lower number um, 21% not directly, but they've seen it occur, and we do have 2% that are, are very fortunate. So that, that is a positive. So we'll turn to our next slide and tell you a little bit about the survey that, um, that was conducted and the data that we collected. Abuse in the workplace is a massive global problem that finds its way into every type of business category in North America. In an effort to learn more about the incidence of co-worker abuse in the healthcare industry, the five partner colleges administered a survey amongst their regulated members in December 2014. Uh, between all five colleges, we had 1,600 healthcare professionals respond. Um, one of the first um, findings that I would like to highlight to you is that the survey did indicate that 80.7% of all those healthcare workers surveyed had experienced abusive behavior from a colleague. And of that, 78% was in, within the last year. We also learned that 85% had witnessed a coworker treating other staff members abusively. And 97.7% uh, of those had witnessed this abusive behavior in the last year. And finally, 53% of those surveyed felt that the work setting tolerated abusive coworker behavior. And that's pretty striking because that is over half. But perhaps even more alarming is that 62% did nothing about the abusive behavior simply because they believed that nothing would change. So these survey findings have most definitely confirmed the need for development of resources that would create awareness, recognition, and prevention of co-worker abuse in the workplace. 
So I would now like to turn the presentation over to Teresa, who is going to discuss a little bit about the background of the project and why it really matters. Thank you, Anne. We'll just get the camera around and we'll be ready to go. So healthcare teams, organizations, uh, regulators, employers, we've been talking about the issue uh, uh, or about the development of quality practice environments for years. It's, it's not a new conversation. We mentioned that these environments require, require the development of trust and respect and involvement in decision making and collaboration and all of those concepts that we're so familiar with. But we often fail to recognize or bring forward the issues around the way we treat each other on a day-to-day -day basis within our healthcare teams. And this really is what we call the elephant in the room. The good news is that over the last several years, this conversation is starting to happen. And it's happening regularly and throughout the country and in, even in parts of the world. And you'll hear a little bit about that in a moment. And we really believe that's a, a positive thing because by identifying it, talking about it, we actually are starting to manage it already. And we can tell by the interest we've had in just this webinar with, uh, what did we have? Oh, 300 and some people signed up today, that there is interest in the topic for sure. So when you look at the literature based around coworker abuse, horizontal violence, disruptive behavior in the workplace, you will see it identified as a major occupational health issue and a work-based stressor. So that's no surprise. There's been considerable research done in the countries listed here on this slide, and although much of the research has been based around specific professions, through our survey it really appears that there's some pretty broad transferability to all health professionals. When, the, when you look at this through the occupational health and safety lens, this, I think, is the difference now, is that we're actually starting to focus on it as an occupational health and safety issue within the workplace. And it's clear that coworker abuse is now seen as a psychological hazard. And there's numerous organizations that are discussing the effects and the consequences if it's not managed. You can see information on the World Health Organization's website the Mental Health Commission of Canada developed a national standard on psychological safety in the workplace. There is the Health Quality Council of Alberta document, the Provincial Framework on uh, Disruptive Behaviours, developed right here in Alberta involving many <coughs> regulators and some employers that were part of that discussion. <coughs> Some of the literature in North America also speaks to the fact that there's even an emerging legal climate where employers can actually be held liable if unmanaged psychological hazards are, are perpetuated within the workplace. This speaks to the responsibility that employers really have in management of psychological hazards and coworker abuse and in identifying those issues and managing them appropriately but also the responsibility of every single health professional in having an understanding of the role they might play within that. In fact, we know that in 2013, Alberta Health Services, one of the largest employer of health professionals in Alberta, noted that mental health issues, and these are general mental health issues, not just coworker abuse related, but generally, were the, are the fastest growing disability claims. So there's a real momentum for uh, and motivation for employers to start examining this more deeply. The good news is that there is a new philosophy emerging and that is that we need to protect the mental health of our workforce as much as we protect the physical health. And that's really the basis around the work that we've been doing on this topic. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Leanne, and she's going to show you some of the uh, services that we have developed as part of our project. Thanks, Teresa. As part of our project, we considered three different theories around abuse and why abuse continues to perpetuate in the work environment. Those were fish and water theory, oppression theory, and broken window theory. And we created a series of video vignettes to highlight the theories and behaviors. The theme of the vignette series was overheard, and the point being that 
what we say to each other in, in the context of work is overheard by our colleagues and by our patients, often with negative consequences. The videos that we've created are brief, but packed with both behaviors of note that Lindsay's already highlighted, and, and some underlying theory. And so I'm going to highlight a few things as we go through the vignettes, just to make sure that you don't miss anything, because they are very fast. The first theory we we're going to talk about is fish and water theory, which basically says that we become so accustomed to our negative work environments that we fail to even notice things after a while. And so as we look at Mary's experience in healthcare, I want you to take a notice of, first off, the receptionist's face. Do you think that she hears this every day? Second off, if you were the young employee who storms out midway through the video, would you stay with this employer or would you be looking for a new job? And finally, as Mary follows her healthcare provider into the treatment area, what do you think she's thinking? So with those things in mind, we'll watch Fish and Water Theory. Where's Dave? He called in, he's sick. What? He's always sick. And you know he's not actually sick. Come on, give him a break. Why are you defending him? Maybe if you weren't always on his case, he'd come in. He should probably be looking for another job. Keep your voice down. The clients can hear you. Maybe they'll hear the truth. You know what? I'm sick of this. You're the problem. You're the one with the most seniority. If you don't like it, you can always leave. Oh, fine, I will. Good luck. Hello, Mary. Welcome. Did you just want to follow me this way? Did you have any uh, problems finding the place? No. Great. Okay. The next theory that we're going to highlight is oppression theory. And the premise of that is that power imbalances in the workplace lead to one group taking advantage or abusing another group, while the disadvantaged group never seems to win. As we look at Mike's experience, I want you to keep your eye on Mike's reaction as he overhears what's going on outside his curtain area. I also want you to notice how the supervisor in this scenario drops your voice when the other patients walk past. It's almost as though she thinks that they can, or realizes that they can hear her, but thinks that Mike can't hear her because he's behind the curtain. And finally, if you were the young assistant, do you, would you keep working there? Would you work in healthcare anymore at all? What would you be feeling? So with that in mind, we'll look at oppression theory. Hey, hey, how many times have I told you to fill out the files correctly? Come on, you should know this by now. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just having a bad day. Well, you seem to be having a lot of bad days. Look, everyone here is starting to wonder, why was it that we hired you? This is a joke. Let's not get dramatic, okay? We're short-staffed. Just get it together. Do your job. Act like a man. Hey, Mike. Hi. How are you? Um, doing all right. Yeah? Okay, so it's been a couple weeks. How are you feeling? Oh, I was feeling all right before, but then I went out last time. Uh, all right. And next up, we're going to look at broken window theory. And the premise of broken window theory is essentially that when abusive behavior is left unaddressed, it will continue. So we're going to take a look at Audrey's experience in care. How was your break? Not long enough. Have you seen Jan? I think she's supposed to be with me on this shift. Yeah, she's away. I'm covering. I think she's still on leave. Okay, whatever. It'll just be a minute. Did you just roll your eyes at me? Oh, well, we'd be nice with that if you don't just didn't a break whenever you're tired. Yeah. You want to know why Jan's on stress leave? Yeah, sure. Because it's so negative here. No, what? Jan was awakening. No, she can't. That's exactly what I mean. There's no respect here. Do you need to take a stress leave? 
You like it gone? Forget it, David. Things never change here. As we come to a close with that video, I want to ask you if you've just watched those two healthcare providers have that discussion, would you want to approach either one of them to tell them information about a patient or to complete a patient handover with them? If not, what do you think the consequences could be for your patient? I think the words at the end, nothing ever changes around here, are pretty powerful and telling, and I wonder how many people would say the same thing about their own work environment. And with that note, we're going to launch another poll of the audience. And we'd like to know from you which of the videos reminded you of something you've witnessed or been a part of in your own work environment. The fish and water theory, that was where's Dave? Depression theory, be a man? Broken window theory, did you just roll your eyes at me or none of the above? So we'll just give you a few seconds to answer that poll. Okay, and it looks like the majority of the audience has voted, so we'll go ahead and uh, show those results. Uh, it looks like uh, most people identified with the fish and water theory and broken window theory, with oppression theory being a close third, uh, and, and a real minority having never experienced anything uh, of the sort. So that's very interesting and good information for us to have. So on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Teresa, who's going to walk you through some resources that we've created to help you manage abusive behavior in the work environment on our website. So uh, as part of this project, the videos that Leanne has just shared with you are available on a new website that we have launched, and I'm just getting it up here for you to take a look at. It's um, www thingsneedtochange.ca and on this site you'll see um, information that we've shared with you here today, um, some of the stats and the statistic information and the videos are all there for you to access and play a game, share with your teams, use as a learning tool and we're very hopeful that these will be used as learning tools within um, potentially within educational settings within your, um, your learning needs as a team, uh, even individual, of course, learning needs. And then there's more reading for you here at this spot on the web page where you can take a look at the, some links, some information related to the issues, which is what Lindsay shared with you earlier, and the solutions. And so we haven't just identified this as an issue, We've also developed some tools for you to use as an individual with a team or if you're in a leadership role that you can um, access through the PDFs or on the website at these two links. And I really encourage you to take a look at that. I'm going to get my little scrolly thing back here. And we'll just move down here. And on a positive note, we really felt that part of changing uh, this issue within the workplace is, is the responsibility of all of us. And if we can just all commit to doing one good thing a day, the positive change can happen, small, small bits, bit by bit, and, um, and that we all have a part to play in that. And so for fun, we've developed some information here for you related to one good thing a day that you can work with your team and, and develop into some, uh, some really interactive workplace activities that might help to improve your culture and your environment that you're in. And again, um, all of our organizations are noted on the web page and we're very happy to see um, the, the information on this page is here for your use. And uh, all we ask is that you, um, you attribute it back to this project and um, you can see all of our information at the bottom of the page there. So with that, I'm turning it back to Leanne. Thanks, Teresa. So the intention of this project was to spark a conversation among healthcare workers with the aim of making things better. And with that aim, we'd like to know from you one last poll. 
we'd like to know how you will use, well actually two last polls I should say, how you will use these resources. So will you watch the videos, review the resources and reflect on your own behavior? Will you share them at a future team meeting and use the videos to educate coworkers about the dangers of psychological hazards in the workplace? Or will you use them to spark a team discussion about how to make your own workplace better? And you can choose as many as apply to your case, but we would like to know how you intend to use them. And we'll give you a few more seconds to respond. All right, and we're getting close to the majority of the audience having voted, so we'll go ahead and, and uh, show those results. Uh, really excellent feedback for us, again, to uh, know how you'll be using these in future, uh, both for your own education and to support your teams at work. And our last polling question, which is kind of similar to the, the previous one, but we would also like to know how, who you will share these resources with, with your team and coworkers, your team leaders, your manager, or someone else. So again, one last poll here, just to get some insight on that question. I'll just give you a few more seconds to vote. Okay, and we've hit the majority of our audience voting on that one, so we'll go ahead and populate those results. And uh, again, it's great feedback for us to have in terms of who you'll be sharing these resources with. Uh, I wish I knew who other was going to be actually now in mm -hmm. hindsight. I wish I, we had the opportunity to learn who that would be. But uh, thank you very much for those answers. It's great information for us to have going forward. So on that note, and on behalf of all of our project partners, I'd like to thank you for attending today's webinar. And I do encourage you to go back to the website, use the resources, look at the videos again, the website is, again, www.thingsneedtochange.ca. So we do hope that you'll use these and share them widely with your colleagues. And on that note, I think we'll call the webinar to a close. Thanks, everybody.